Hey everybody, I'm Robin from Backscatter and thanks for joining us on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. Today we are talking about getting face to face with big animals in the wild with professional underwater shooter Ron Watkins. How are you doing over there, Ron? Hey, doing pretty good. Thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it, Robin. We're really stoked to be having you join us for this live session. Um, so we're going to be going over some of your favorite uh, photos where you get face to face with some really big animals and some other kind of interesting subjects too. Um, we got some really cool stuff to share with you or with, with all of you viewers out there. So we're going to go through these images and kind of break down how Ron captured them and really everything you need to know to go out and take the same kind of awesome images. Uh, and if you have any questions, you want to learn any more about these shots, feel free to drop a comment in the chat and we will, uh, you know, see what we can do to get that answered live on the stream here. But before we get to the shots themselves, Ron, I'd like you to kind of introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started in this world of underwater photography. Okay, th thanks, Robin. Um, I've been doing underwater photography for about 20 years and... Um, really got started as you know at a pretty early age picked up a camera to share photos like most of us do uh, with my dad and family members and friends and, and really just sort of uh, I was actually diving first I've been diving since I was 15 my, my dad taught me and um, you know was struggling a bit like we all do and and then about 12 13 about 12 years ago went to a, a backscatter shootout and I was pretty intimidated by it's a shootout, thinking it was this intense contest, but uh, made some amazing friends, had a great time, all the workshops, and it just really, uh, I, I think it had a lot to do with propelling me to the next level of underwater photography. Um, so over those years, I've been fortunate enough to have some things published, uh, images as well as my writing, uh, pick up a few um, international awards along the way, and uh, really excited because now I get to lead backscatter photo workshops. So that's a lot of fun for me. Um, I, I really take my passion for the ocean and sharks and have have latched on to Sharks for Kids. And if you're not familiar with Sharks for Kids, highly encourage you to check out their website. And I serve as a shark ambassador. So uh, I work with children, teaching them about sharks, their important role, and uh, what they can do to make a difference in shark conservation. So. Uh, I think that's a little bit uh, about me, so I'm, I'm excited to get uh, started talking about some images. Yeah, me too, man. Um, I, I just want to say I think it's really cool that, you know, you played such a, a neat role in, or, you know, had a, such a cool relationship with us here at Backscatter from being able to kind of get your start into this to now, yeah, taking folks out into the field and, you know, giving them the professional advice and courteous service and stuff that we're known for. So glad to have you as part of the backscatter family i think it's really cool how we how we got Thanks. started I, on this i appreciate that yeah so let's uh cut it over to the first image here we're gonna get face to face with our first big animal <laughs> we got a pretty awesome this looks like a saltwater croc yeah it is it's a uh, pretty big saltwater croc um i photographed this down in cuba in the gardens of the queen nice so how how big is this guy how close are you getting to capture this shot uh, the, the, the crocs that we were in the water with, uh, you know, got up 10 to 12 feet, and I like to tell people that. But the reality, this one is probably only about six or seven feet. I say only. That's still a good-sized croc when uh, it's it's got its mouth right in your face. <laughs> um, and then you get a little bit of forced perspective with this image, the way I, I shot it with the 8 to 15 uh, fisheye. So it makes it larger than life as well. And so with that fisheye, you got to get pretty close to this guy. How, how close are you? Um, well, this, this uh, particular one has, had bumped several of us photographers. Uh, I don't, it wasn't really aggressive. I'll say more curious and uh, tenacious, and it would come in fairly close. If you look on the top of the snout, you can actually see where its snout is pushed up against my dome port. So um, <laughs> without having the camera in its mouth, I, I don't think I could have gotten any closer to this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's so cool. You don't, you don't catch that detail at first, but then when you realize it's that's subtle, like, yeah. Yeah, that's, you're, <laughs> you are literally booping the snoot. 
Yeah, very yeah. cool, as they say. They always say, get close, and if, <laughs> if you're not close, get closer. So <laughs> he, he decided to get closer to me. So <laughs> Nice. So uh, as far as exposure settings here go and some of that metadata we've got on the screen, looks like maybe shooting a little higher ISO, I'm guessing, because of that cloud cover overhead. Yeah, exactly. So um, I am using strobes with this, but uh, I, you know, it was a pretty dark day, so I, I needed to get some more light under the water. So I, I, I bumped bump the ISO up a little bit uh, with my camera. Typical wide angle at the surface like this, I'd be, you know, shooting a hundred or, or two hundred, but that gave me a little bit more illumination under the water. Um, and then, um, you know. Decided to uh, you know have that nice moody cloudiness feel and and try to feature more of the crocodile out of the water. I had gotten a lot of images of it you know different positions swimming and open mouth underwater and uh, really wanted to get one like this that it was coming at me and, and highlighting some of its uh, primary features. In other words, its teeth and eyes. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, that's th those features always look great you know, on a crock shot, but I think adding in the split element to this is really what makes it. I think that's just, it's so cool. Um, tell me a little bit about trying to capture an adequate depth of field on this guy. Like, you know, mm. when you're working this close, it's almost like shooting macro when it comes to depth of field. So how are you getting both the, the snout and the eye in focus? It, it, it is, you're absolutely right. So um, you know, with this lens, I can focus about six inches, uh, which is which is right at the dome port, pretty much, because the lens is set back. Um, your aperture, you you want to uh, you know make that as small an aperture as possible, which means increase your number. So I'm at f16. Probably could have even done f22 if you wanted, but again, I was playing with the light thing. Um, but but at f16 in that particular lens, when it gives a really really nice depth of field. If you look um, at the bottom though, those those little uh, you know the little uh, hands out there that have a hard time grabbing the credit card when the dinner bill comes, um, <laughs> they get they start to get a little soft. I don't think it takes away from it. Um, the important thing I wanted to capture was that distance from eye to uh, to the snout and all those uh, teeth shiny teeth uh, in between. Um, so with split shots, you, you, you typically will have an F16, uh, F22 type of uh, aperture. You're wanting to get as much depth of feel as possible. And with this particular cooperative subject, he was actually you know, going up and down in the water, and I was just following it. So um, was able to come up and, and pop off a bunch of shots and uh, had my strobes positioned down. Um, powered down quite a bit because I didn't want it looking like I'm blasting uh, a shark. I wanted it to look natural, just give it a little bit of fill light. And that also allowed me to recycle very, very quickly because you need very fast um, frames per second. So I was shooting probably three to four frames per second and my strobes were keeping up just fine uh, with this. Nice. Yeah, you can definitely, I mean, it, it's hard to tell that there are strobes being used in this shot because you created such a yeah. natural lighting look. And that's, yeah, I think playing them low and fast like that was the way to go. As you were firing off all these shots, how many did it really take to nail this perfect one? What how, what was the, the patience like on this one? <laughs> Well, patience uh, is key with split shots in particular. You know, the, you know, there's a saying you sort of create your own luck, and it's just repetition. And so, first you got to practice, and then when you get the opportunity, you have to take lots of shots because a split second could mean the difference of that that croc's nose down or turned or you know not quite everything in focus the way you want it. So. Um, I, I probably got about three or four good passes where he came at me and came up. Uh, in each one, I, I probably rattled off uh, 15, 20, 25 shots each time. Um, it's really the the spray and pray method. So uh, once I, I was using rear back button focus as it was coming, once I would lock on to it, I could very easily just hold down that shutter and, and crank it out. And uh, then back on the boat, you, you take a look and if need be, make adjustments and uh, this one really stood out, I think, you know, mainly because it, it, it did bump a little bit, uh, but it's not noticeable at first. But patience is key and, and lots of shots on these split shots. Certainly paid off here. And were you totally Thanks. satisfied with the result you got in camera using that technique or did you have to help this out in Lightroom at all? 
Yeah, most most split shots um, that I take and that you see um, do need some adjustments in post. A lot of the times, because I'm exposing, trying to expose for the top side in this one, um, I knew I was going to have to lighten the bottom. So I did do some uh, lightening on the exposure on the bottom side. Um, also played a little bit with the white balance to give it a little bit more warmth because as, as I was mentioning, there wasn't a lot of sun out there, but I still wanted to, to, to portray those, those true colors of the crocodile um, and not make it look too cold, mm -hmm. um, looking for a little bit more warmth in there. So those are really the main things. And then, as I mentioned before, this was shot uh, circular fisheye, which would have that circle around it, the black circle, which is cool. Um, but I had enough space around it that I could do a nice crop of it. And I just, I thought it looked a lot nicer. I didn't think the circle added much. Awesome, man. Awesome. Hey, a couple questions from the chat on this yeah. one. Uh, our friend Will Morrison wants to know how many dome ports have you gone through with all those sharp teeth in front of you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I have, uh, gone through quite a few dome ports, uh, particularly if you have acrylic dome, you better bring your, uh, your buff kit with you because you'll be buffing just like shooting sharks. Um, and I've had friends that have had teeth um, hit and uh, scratch their dome ports quite a bit as well. Uh, but fortunately, I've had that same glass nine inch dome port for three years, knock on wood. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, it, it'll, it'll keep me going another three. Um, but uh, it, it is a good one. You know, the, the positive with the glasses, the water droplets don't adhere on it, so you, you get less of them. Uh, but the acrylic, you can buff that out. You can't buff out the glass, so yeah. trade-offs. And hey, one more question from our friend Julian Gunther. Uh, he says, thanks for doing this, first of all. And he wants sure to know, uh, how do you position your strobes and lighting when doing a split in a lower light environment or even like at night? So kind of balancing ISO and shutter against those strobes. What's, what's your go-to? Yeah, so what I do, and probably most of the shots you're going to see today because they're big animals and they're close, um, I actually do something you, you probably don't see a lot. Um, usually you see these big old honking arms, two of them, and they're floating around. And, you know, that's a great setup if you're shooting reef scenes or something really, really big. But when you, you're shooting animals and they're going to be close, I actually use a single nine-inch arm. I've, I've got my strobe here. So I've got a single nine-inch arm, and that's it. So that's as far as I can go out, um, you, you know. So... I can also pull them back, which which I do. Um, and in this particular one, they're down here at sort of this position. So if, if my hand is the is the uh, center of the camera, it's lower because I wanted to get the strobe underneath that crocodile and light some of that up, just give it a splash of light. Um, but you're going to find that you know most of these shots I'm showing you that the strobes are in tight, back a little bit, and just flared out a little bit. So that's that's my go-to uh, strobe setting for these in your face, close, big animal shots. Nice, nice. And then of course, just, you know, having to balance ISO shutter speed aperture against that to try and, you know, still, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the strobes I use in strobes nowadays have really, really nice fine tuned setting. My, my goal is because I do want the option to shoot continuous. Um, I, I never really like to flood more than, um, on my strobe about a third of a power. And that gives me the confidence to, to keep up with a two to three uh, frames per second. And if it does fade off, well, it's a bonus because you're actually bracketing the strobe light. So you may get, uh, particularly if that croc came too close, I might have got it blown out. And maybe a, a powered down strobe on a recycle might have helped. So, um, yeah, that's it's, it's all a balancing game. You're dealing with the triad of uh, aperture, shutter, and ISO. And uh, distance obviously comes into play as well. All right. Awesome. Thanks for those answers. We're going to move it on down to our next shot here where we're switching it up with a different type of big animal. Now we're getting a little sharky with it. Tell us about this one, Ron. Looks like we're, uh, we're getting creative here. Yeah. I, um, one of my favorite things uh, to teach in uh, workshops is these slow shutter speed blur shots. Um, they're so much fun. People really enjoy it. And Particularly in a location like the Cocos, where we were, um, I was on the backscatter trip last year, actually with with Burke and uh, Berkeley White and a lot of the other folks, Aaron Quigley from uh, 
from Backscatter. And we just, we had a fantastic time in Coco, saw great sharks. And these, these, these white tips, we saw them, you know, almost on every single dive. And they were very curious. They're sort of puppy dogs. You're not looking and they come at you. So we all got all kinds of shots that you can imagine. And then I gave a little talk on uh, blurred and, and blur shots. And uh, this, this posed a good subject. But what's funny, when you do teach how to do this and, and talk about swirling and stuff, the next dive, you see all the divers in there going like this. You think they're... <laughs> They're a bunch of newbie divers or something, but they're just having fun. Um, so sometimes if, you know, you can take a common subject that you've shot a lot and create something a little bit different, like this uh, blur shot. Very cool. Um, so I see here you're shooting with a 16 to 35 as opposed to that 8 to 15. So yeah. probably not quite as close to this guy as that croc. What's, what is your working distance like here? So when you're shooting these these uh, blur shots, it's it's your flash that's freezing the action because your shutter opens and stays open and then closes. So any motion in that time frame until the flash goes off, and I use typically a rear curtain on this one in particular, um, you're going to get blurriness. So what makes that so crisp, that eye in the leading edge of the shark, is that flash. So. I have to be close enough with my with my strobe to the subject. So in this case, one when it it made a turn at the last minute right in front of me, um, and it it you know it's probably about uh, three feet from me. So with these strobes, it, it, that can definitely reach that uh, that range, no problem. Okay. The closer, awesome. the better. And uh, um, and, and if you look at the shot, you can see as you go back, in other words, that strobe light is less effective and can't penetrate the water. The further you go back in the shot, the more blur you see. And this was a spin blur, which means I took the camera, I hit the shutter, it was open, and then pop. It, the shutter closed and the flash went off. So that's how I was able to, uh, to nail this swirl effect. Uh, the, the shark cooperated and gave me a nice turn that I think sort of mirrors the pattern in the swirl, which mm -hmm. uh, I, I really like in this shot. Yeah, no doubt, man. So you're doing one eighth shutter speed to get this kind of uh, this blur and that motion drag. Yes, uh, depending on the the subject, um, the 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 how fast it's going to be. If you're spinning, uh, usually for these slow motions, I'm doing between one fifth and and one tenth. Obviously, that's a rule of thumb. Um, and because you're doing that, you have to compensate with your aperture, or you're going to blow out your shot. So. Um, you know, f18 is a pretty, uh, pretty small aperture for a wide angle shot, but again, it's compensating with that. And then the ISO uh, is really the equalizing factor. So you can adjust that accordingly. So what I typically will do is try to expose from my background that I'm looking for in, in the desired look and feel, and then wait for that shark to come in. And I can always adjust the strobe power if I need to. If it's it's if it's, maybe it's not coming in quite close enough, or maybe it's coming in very close, I might need to turn those strobes down. Okay, okay. And were you doing kind of the same strobe position as you mentioned with the Crocs? Is this that same like single arm setup? And uh... I was. Um, so on this shot, I, I had the strobes more a little bit above nine and three. Um, you, you can see the one on the left is where he was closest to. And that's really was key um, because that's what froze that eye and that side of him that lit him up. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the strobes were sort of up here um, on the, on that setup. Um, again, um, I did have my big dome on as well. Um, and those strobes were out from the dome and it, it just gave it a really nice light. And, and you, you got to play around with this. Um, you'll take a lot of bad blur shots. You'll get a lot of blurry blur shots, uh, mm -hmm. which, which <laughs> it's real, it's, it's a real, uh, you know, subtle thing about too much blur versus not enough blur to get the desired effect. But, you know, they say arts in the eye of the beholder. So, uh, <laughs> I, I like this one. It works. And, uh, I've seen a lot of cool shots from, from other people on the boat that just, you know, blow me away. Some of the, the cool effects that they can get with these blur shots. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hey, a couple questions from the chat here. Our friend Jeffrey Katz wants to know what strobe was that, that you showed? What, uh, what is your weapon of choice for these shots? Um, well, I have I have several strobes. Um, 
I shoot uh, mostly the, the CNC strobes, so I've got the um, D2Js. Um, started off a long time ago with 90s, if you remember the uh, CNC 90s. Um, but this one actually is a 250. Um, it was a, a CNC strobe that, that came out quite a while ago. They've unfortunately discontinued it, uh, but it's just a very powerful strobe. When you're looking at strobe, don't just uh, focus on the guide number. Uh, the recycle is really, really important, and uh, not all guide numbers are equal. So when you're looking at that, uh, you've got to look at the coverage and the nice, how nice that light is. And these strobes have just worked really, really well for me. I actually, these are the same strobes I got 10, 12 years ago at one of the shootouts. I, I won a strobe, and then of course you got to buy the other one. Um, <laughs> but I've had them all this time, so you know, 10, 10, 12 years is pretty good life for strobes, and maybe have them serviced once. But they're, they're, they've been good for me. Yeah, but no, someday I'm going to have to replace them. No doubt about that. And even though that strobe is discontinued, we do have a lot of really good currently available options that can do yeah. image results like this and much more, even with you know fast recycle time and very smooth beam. So feel free to reach out to our team here if you need some help picking out your next one. Um, and, and I look forward to uh, trying out some of those strobes uh, when I get back in the water. So yeah. <laughs> hopefully you guys can hook me up with some nice ones to try out. Um, Maxine Baker was asking, did you worry about getting bit at all? Uh, like either, I guess that could apply to either of the last two shots. <laughs> um, by the shark or my dive buddy or what? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, I've never been bit, um, by any shark. Um, I've been bit by a dog before, um, <laughs> but uh, no, I've never been bit by a shark. I will say we, we had an incident where someone did get a little love bite um, by the croc, um, but when they start to show that type of behavior, sort of territorial behavior, you really need to um, heed those warnings and get out of the water. There are cases where conditions and, and the, the environment and the um, so sort of the feeling that you get from the shark isn't conducive to, to, to getting that close with them. So mm -hmm. you really just have to judge the, the situation. But that those white tips uh, ne never felt threatening to me. But we, we might see some pictures later that I that I tell some other stories. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then our other fan uh, and friend here, Chris Duncan, was asking um, on this shark shot, were you shooting a higher strobe power than the croc or still about that like third power? Um, probably about third power. And hey, Chris, how you doing? Hope things are good down in Atlanta, I believe. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, you know, it was about the same. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. On this spin shot. No, no. Um, the strobes were actually quite a bit brighter. So with spin shots, you're not looking to do the continuous you know, three, three frames per second, you're looking for that one, you know, timed shot because that shutter's open. And because you need as much light, I was probably one click down from full power. Um, these sharks aren't too bad, but some sharks are very, very white. And so you got to be careful being that high, but, but this shark, um, particularly the front of the shark, uh, it actually can absorb some light. So I had to really crank up uh, the strobes on this. So good question. And, uh, thanks for asking that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. Awesome. Well, I think with that, let's move on to our next shot here. We've got a little bit more of an uncommon subject in <laughs> this one. Tell us what we're looking at here, Ron. So um, I get a lot, you know, when I put this slide up, I get a lot of guesses uh, for those of you who don't know me and that I photograph these sharks, you know, is it a white shark, you know, is it a mako? Um, and it's actually a salmon shark, which is a type of mackerel shark. And it does have the look and feel of a, uh, a white shark. But when you look closer, you'll notice some subtle differences. Those eyes are more forward. Um, that mouth is, is not as large and it's really more torpedo shaped. I, I sort of refer to it as a big lawn dart, if you've ever thrown <laughs> those lawn darts. Um, and, uh, you know, the dorsal fin is, 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 is fairly small, but the pectoral fins, uh, go out quite a bit and it'll, it allows it for speed and agility in the water. So this shark, everyone believes the Mako shark is the fastest shark, but actually, um, there's been some Navy studies that have clocked these sharks faster than the Mako. So, 
Um, you know, it, it wasn't official settings and all of that, but the rumor is these are the fastest sharks out there. Man, that's kind of surprising considering he looks like, you know, a little little chunky or a little squat, more like, yeah, a little, I don't know, a little, <laughs> just a little chunkier than a white shark. So that's, yeah, uh, they're very, very uh, dynamic in the water, uh, hydrodynamic. Cool. They can, they can build up some speed, but it's not for long periods of time. It's just like the Mako. It's, it's bursts of energy to get its prey. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be going after salmon, herring, squid, which are very small. That's why the, the mouth is adapted to be that. And the teeth are, are like that because they just want to get one tooth on their prey and then they'll end up wounding it and getting it. And they, they need a burst of energy um, because those salmon can, can swim pretty fast. So and help, try to help maneuver them. Where are you in the um, water with this guy? This looks like kind of kind of murky. It looks like he'd be <laughs> he'd be right on top of you before you could even see him, huh? Well, it, it, you know that's one of the challenges. So I, I was up in Alaska outside of Valdez at a lodge called Ravencroft, and uh, it, it's really probably one of the best chances of you getting in the water with one of these sharks. That being said. Um, I myself and many, many other photographers have gone up there to try to photograph them and, and after a whole week of trying, walked away with no images underwater, uh, maybe only seeing a few from the surface. Uh, so this is a very elusive shark um, and it's very skittish. So if you are lucky enough to get in the water, this is the type of water you got. Um, it's a lot of uh, runoff, so you get that mixture of the um, salt water with the fresh water, so you get sort of a murky wave across the water. You also get a lot of particulates in the water. Uh, jellyfish blooms are very common up here as well, so there's typically just a, a really muckiness pea soup uh, feel to the water. The other thing complicating and, and making uh, photographs of this particular shark difficult is the weather. So um, the weather up there can be very dynamic and, and change, you know, this on, a, on a fairly sunny day, but you get a lot of clouds and rains in the June, July timeframe when you're up there. Uh, so very, very challenging conditions, not only to find these, but then once you do uh, try to get a, a good shot of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I see again, shooting 16 to 35 here, probably because again, you know, going for the, what the, the highest likelihood of capturing the subject as opposed to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't know, um, you know, I'd never been in the water with these and I'd only talked to a few people, one being uh, Boone Hodgen, who's sort of the, the salmon shark whisperer guide that, that takes you out. <laughs> Um, so he obviously gave some advice on lens selection, which was spot on. Uh, I also think the uh, WACP um, would be a really nice uh, piece of glass to take in uh, with these sharks. So I may be uh, trying that uh, in the near future. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, the whole thing is I wanted to get a shot and I didn't know how close they were going to do. And the 16 to 35 gives you more range. And it, it really is my go-to shark um uh, sh shark lens. So unless they're right up on your dome port, you're not going to cut off, you know, the shark. Um, but when you zoom this all the way out to 16, you actually get a really, really nice uh, wide angle of field in here. So um, I didn't cut off too many of them with this, but there were some encounters where I did get bumped. Uh, the question was asked earlier. Uh, this was probably a situation because I didn't know the behavior of this shark that I was a little bit more cautious um, getting in the water. And as you pointed out, Robin, you can't always see them coming because it's so dark. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, uh, a good shot to pull off given the kind of <laughs> kind of spooky conditions you might be in while waiting for that guy. Um, yeah. I noticed, too, you're at F9, so you're a little wider open on the aperture. Um, any concern about corner sharpness or anything like that here? <laughs> You know, with with these sharks, I was um, I was shooting, and in general, when I when I shoot the sharks, I I try to leave a little bit of space around the edge um, for a couple reasons. One is because of that, but but I don't care if the water's blurry. Actually, in this case, I I wanted it to be blurry because there was so much crud in the water. Uh -huh. um, but also, if you've ever shot with wide angle lenses, one of the most frustrating parts is sometimes you get a little flare. Uh, from your strobe, particularly if it's too close in. And if you remember what I was saying, I, I'm using this single strobe arm option because when you're shooting sharks, you're spinning around a lot and you've always got to keep your eye on them. And if, you're, if you've got these big gangly arms, you're, you may uh, move your strobe position um, because you're, you're whipping around, your head's on a swivel. Um, so in this particular case, F9 was, was a good, you know, F8, F9, I think was, was a good one. And it also, 
gave me a decent depth of field for the range that he was in, but I don't mind it fading out. I really, really wanted it to stand out. And a lot of times when I go for these shots, um, I try to give it a three dimensional field. And, you know, if, say if you'd go down to F 6.3, you'd even have a more narrow one. It would have been even more faded, but this one sort of pops out of the murkiness, um, which I, I really like, uh, with these settings and that lens that, that lens can, the other key thing about the 16 to 35 is it's got to be one of the quickest focusing lenses. I mean, it it can lock on to that eyeball and follow it very, very well. Is that basically what you did as this guy's coming in the water towards you? How do you how do you balance the zoom and the focus in such a dynamic environment? Yeah, good good question. So uh, you do have that nice focus ring. So um, you know, my left hand is is on that, and I'm panning with it. I'm never taking my eye off of the shark. Um, and when it turns to come in, um, I'm actually backing out on it. And the other nice thing about this lens is it maintains that focus. So even if I wouldn't have retapped the back button to re-engage focus to that, as you as you zoom out or zoom in, it, it maintains that focus, which is, is a pretty nice feature of it. Um, you know, that's really how I, I'm able to get some of this tack sharpness is just using that back button focus to fine tune it as it's coming in because. Um, you know, you, you got to be careful. Also, I use single point. Um, you know, a lot of people might think, hey, I use multi point or, or automatic and, and the D850 actually has a really nice um, uh, matrix mode. But in this case, there, there's other stuff in the water and you're just not certain what it might pick up. And so I like uh, taking total manual control and just putting that point or maybe nine point at most. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to lock on the difference between dark and light, which is the eye and the, the teeth and the mouth. So mm -hmm. that's yeah, that high contrast. That's zone. the money features on, on, on the shark. Cool. So. Cool. Uh, Jeffrey Katz was asking how much post work went into this one and he had to, you know, rescue it in Lightroom or was this basically straight out of camera? Yeah. These, these sharks, um, because of the white, um, you, you got to be careful with motion blur. That's why, you know, lessons learned. I, I maybe even would have kicked it up to F11. Um, but the, but this one was so close, it froze the action. Um, but I did get some chunky stuff in the water. So obviously I was able to, to soften that water a little bit. Um, I did crop this because as I mentioned, um, when, because these sharks are so fast, the last thing I want to do is cut off the tail as it's coming at me. So I'm usually cropped out a fair amount uh, around it. So I wanted a little bit tighter, tighter crop. And then, um, I noticed the entire time there, I was shooting auto white balance in the camera, which I usually do. But for some reason, all of my images were coming out very, very cool, uh, which is more of a bluer, uh, feel. Mm -hmm. And so I actually, uh, adjusted white balance in there to give it the warmth and desaturation a little bit to, uh, to bring out the grayness in the shark. Uh, a little trick that I learned from our friend Aaron Quigley is, you know, if you just pull down in your um, saturation, the aquas, that can also, uh, you know, help make that shark pop a little bit. But honestly, with this image and that water, that water actually has an aqua um, look to it. So you can't really play with that one too much. Nice. Um, but yeah, no, this one, uh, I, I, I'm sure I added a little bit of texture as well to the shark itself. There's a texture tool in there, again, just to give it that, that crispness. Very cool. Thanks, Ron. Hey, for this next one, I'd like to move on to possibly the uh, most terrifying of all big animals, <laughs> the human it's child. Me. Yeah, this, <laughs> the, the most fear invoking of them all. Um, let's take a look at the meta on this one. So break this down for us, man. This is kind of a, a departure from the apex predators in the wild to maybe a more controlled shooting environment. Um, what's well, it like pulling off a shot like this? Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. This is this is my uh, uh, my buddy Aaron's son Joseph, and uh, this is Captain America. That he was going through that phase where you know you got kids, and this is probably one of the more dangerous uh, uh, things I photographed because uh, he he just loved the camera. He loved the lightning bolts that come out. He said they're lightning bolts, and he was using the shield. Uh, but his big thing is he loved jumping in the water. So uh, it was cool for the shot because I was able to get uh, some nice bubble action. Um, so this is big animal photography, and, and the reason I do this before I get into the shot itself is I tell people before you, you know, you spend all this money, you plan this trip, you go out and you dust off the camera that you haven't used in uh, two or three months, 
take it into the pool and shoot something. Even if you don't have a pool, take the camera out and shoot the dog running around because it's going to just help you uh, have that muscle memory so that you're not have to think about it. Um, so I've actually I've photographed probably over 400 kids over the years. I used to do a lot of pool photography and uh, don't do as much now, but um, you know, the trick with this one, the nice thing about it is, is the swimming pool is your underwater stage. So you can use props. Um, here I have a, a red satin sheet, um, and it's floating in the water and there were some jets coming out of the pool. So it was giving that cool ripple a look and with mm -hmm. him jumping, it just looks like he's, he's blasting out of there. Um, you know, just like sharks, you know, it's got a white underbelly. Um, that, that shield was quite shiny. So I had to make the same type adjustments I would when I was shooting sharks. You know, I had my, my strobes out sort of tight. Um, he's, he's, he's coming in pretty fast. And for these type jumping shots, I actually would, would just set preset my distance about a hand's length out. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I didn't want him getting too close to the camera, not for the camera. I didn't want him hurting himself. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when he would jump in, that's when I would fire, fire, fire. And with an F 11, you've got enough depth of field. And because I was far enough back from him, this was a nice sunny day. Um, you know, I was able to get these type of shots and, and most of them were, were pretty crisp, um, in there. There weren't that many of them that were blurry. So, um, I highly encourage people just, you know, you've got this camera sitting in there, take it out. Um, last year, actually, I got the opportunity, uh, for a sharks for kids event we had at the YMCA here in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, I photographed over 20 kids in the water. So that was the most I'd photographed in several years, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, the kids have fun. If you don't have a kid, throw the dog in the, in the pool if it can <laughs> swim. Uh, my, my dog back here, unfortunately, can't swim. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just, you know, get out there and shoot. Don't, don't wait for that once in a lifetime encounter that you have to try to figure out how to use the zoom gear with the back button focus mm -hmm. it, 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 it's built in, in consistent quality yeah yeah no doubt about that um i guess one other thing on there oh just one other thing uh the 16 to 35 the rectilinear lens or, or the 12 to 24 is best when you're shooting people uh if you use the fisheye you would start to distort things so his head might be bigger or if an arm was forward it would be exaggerated uh might look like a superhero, but uh, it's usually not a flattering shot, particularly if you're working with uh, models. Uh, um, you don't want to do that. Yeah, kind of preserve that. Yeah, that natural element and avoid any weird, exaggerated, wide-angle distortion, huh? All right, cool. Well, that's 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 a fun shot. I like this one. This is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. Actually, I think it'd be really cool to to jump in the pool and try and pull off some shots like this. I think that's a good way to mix it up, but. Let's get a little bit more back to our roots here and take a look at this gorgeous encounter between some really big animals and a <laughs> diver friend for scale. Break this one down for us. Where where are we here? Yeah, so uh, this was in last year's um, 2019 Morea Humpback, Humpback Whale Trip that we ran uh, to French Polynesia. Berkeley and I ran three weeks worth of trips and uh, small group trips. Um, so including us, there were only six in the boat at most. Some of the trips we actually scaled down uh, for even smaller. And they're really focused on, um, you know, having those photo opportunities. But we go out with a marine biologist, a local who knows these, uh, these mammals, knows their behavior, and is going to put your safety first, but also the whale's safety. So, you know, no swimming after it, no harassing it, keep your distance. They follow all the rules. So it's a great place to photograph um, these humpback whales in their calves, which they're up there calving um, and raising their, their calves uh, in the summer. Mm -hmm. Man, that, that sounds like an <laughs> epic experience. You, you've got to get on one yeah, of them. Sign it's me up so for that fun. one day. Man. Um, so did you intend to have your model in the shot here or were you going just for whales? Were you guys sharing the scene? What, what, what unfolded there? Yeah. So this was the day, this is my buddy Gerard. Um, him and I went out, uh, we usually go out in the morning, go out in the afternoon. And in the afternoon it was just him and I, which was really nice. The other stayed back, um, maybe drank some, uh, Mai Tais or something. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were take we, we, we're really good together. We've traveled together. We've photographed together. And, uh, usually when someone gets in your shot, you're like, 
gosh darn it, get out, you know, get them out of the shot. Um, and this one wasn't intentional. So it was unintentional that he was, he was in the shot. And it's not that it was my shot, right? You, you've got to have, um, you know, you've got to share. And the whale made a turn and went directly to him. So it may look like he's swimming at the whale, but he's not. He's actually trying to swim to the other side of the whale to get out of its way. But uh, the, the humpbacks actually came right up very, very, even closer to this to him. Uh, it's just the angle of this one and the pectoral fin, the way it was down. I, I really liked it uh, communicating, uh, you know, the, the scene and just how surreal it is. And when you're in the water with these humpback whales, it's it's just an amazing feeling. It's mm -hmm. it's it's spiritual. And seeing this uh, little tiny uh, Gerard, um, you know, next to these, you know, school bus size yeah. uh, marine mammals, it's, it's just it's a phenomenal. And, and there's a special. Um, uh, you know, moment that, that they sort of shared and he, you know, got to really get some good images as well. But I particularly like this image out of most of my shots. I've got plenty of images without divers or free divers, but this is a pretty cool one for perspective. And I think just f not only for that sense of scale, but for that sense of relationship between the two subjects too. They're obviously Absolutely. very curious about each other and just, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful scene. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It, dialing in exposure for a shot like this, I see this is probably our highest ISO we've seen yet at 640. Um, what, what went into consideration when you were getting your settings dialed in? So, uh, with the humpback whales, you're, you're not using strobes. There's no strobe invented that could light up a whale. Yeah. Uh, so it's all ambient light photography. So that's where ISO, a camera that, that has a really good ISO, uh, low noise ratio is key. So with the D850, you can, you can go up pretty high without getting noticeable noise that you can't deal with in post. Um, so with this, the, the key is on the settings is um, you, it's your shutter speed that's going to really freeze the action because you don't have a strobe freezing it. So you've got to maintain a high enough shutter speed, you know, um, and then the aperture, um, you might think you would just you know, open that wide up to six and you could do that. But what I found over the years and uh, of photographing this is again, anytime you have that white black, uh, line, you get a really weird blur between those. Um, and by making the aperture smaller. So on this case, I did an F 10, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, what it's doing is all of the lights going through the center of the lens, which is the best piece of the glass. It's not flaring out on the outer edges mm. like at F6.3. So it really helps uh, with that motion blur. Um, and, and again, this was a, a you know, fairly sunny day, um, but I still cranked it up to 640 just to maintain that, that ratio. But there were some days where it wasn't as choppy. This, this day was actually a little bit choppy. Uh, which which uh, restricts some of the light coming through. Uh, but you do see some nice light beams in this one too. Yeah, yeah. And when you were saying that white-black line, you're talking about like on the whale itself, right? That super high exactly. contrast. Exactly. Um, exactly. And I first encountered this um, when I shot some, uh, some orcas down in the Galapagos. I, I noticed this blur, and actually an editor um, said, yeah, I'd love to publish these, but... You know, I don't think this will print well. And I'm like, what? This is once in a lifetime shot. But mm -hmm. um, and, and the images are good. It's just you, you do see that blur and uh, you don't see it as much till you see it. And then you can't take your eye off it. So um, I just learned over the years, if, if you, you know, put your aperture down a little bit and, and crank that shutter speed up, that's going to really try to give you that crisp line between the dark and the light. Cool. That's a solid pro tip there. Um, Mark Thanks. Mintz was asking, uh, was that ISO from auto ISO? Were you manually dialing that in? Good, good question. So you can, um, shoot these, I, I shoot all in, in manual. Um, but when you're shooting these whales or any aperture, uh, or any ambient light subject, you can shoot a couple of options. You can shoot shutter priority. There's some people that shoot aperture priority, but ISO priorities become more and more popular as these cameras uh, allow you to go to such high ISOs without noise. And you can actually put a cap on it to say, fluctuate the ISO, giving these aperture and shutter speed settings for this given exposure. And that's a great, I didn't shoot it that way. I shot this manual, but that's a really good point. You can shoot this, uh, is, you know, dial in your settings and let the ISO fluctuate and adjust. And then just use your exposure control, which is that little uh, plus and minus black and white. Use that to, to adjust the exposure, either darker or lighter. So uh, 
excellent pro tip from our uh, audience there. <laughs> hey, uh, one other question I kind of want to address here. Uh, Will Morrison was asking, you know, in these crazy times, has work been going on to plan and do future trips while still maintaining space between people? Uh, that is absolutely one of our top priorities on all future trips going forward and making sure that everyone is, you know, staying safe and following guidelines as we need to. Um, so we won't go too much more into deep details on that on this stream, but do please feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to chat about that a little more. Um, and I think on that note, we'll maybe just move on to our next shot here. You'd mentioned orcas in the Galapagos previously, but let's switch it over to something a little funkier in the Galapagos. This, uh, this not Godzilla coming up from the depths, but about <laughs> it, the it next is. closest <laughs> thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this um, this is a marine iguana, and, and it was uh, photographed at uh, Fernandina Island in in the Galapagos. Um, and the Galapagos is a magical place. It's it, you see hammerheads, whale sharks, lots of sea lions, and then on land you've got the blue footed boob boobies. You've got the Galapagos tortoise. Um, but it's really known for these marine iguanas. It's the only way, place you can find these. And, and these iguanas have adapted to dive down and swim and eat this green algae and thrive off of it. Um, and so, you know, we, we only had one afternoon, two dives with, uh, with these iguanas. And, and I sort of had my shot list and something I really encourage people to, to do is um, have an idea. If you know you're going to see a subject, have an idea of the type of shots you want. You want a face-on shot, you want a profile shot, an action shot, behavior shot. So sort of have that checklist. So I had already gotten the, the classic shot, which he's sitting there eating and, you know, he's got his mouth uh, down there. And uh, I spent the second dive almost entirely trying to get this free swimming type of shot. And, and I got a lot of different shots. This one I like just because he's still got some algae. You know, it's mm -hmm. like when you get up and get your spinach caught in your teeth. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, had a pretty nice background. I would have liked a little bit more blue, but his head at least is coming into the blue water. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this one, this was a shot that was on my list uh, that I was fortunate enough to to get. And I, I stocked this particular uh, marine iguana for quite a bit. <laughs> I really like this composition. I, mean, I like that side profile, that bit, like almost kind of human looking arm and bicep and that just very like distinct yeah. face. I mean, he you really couldn't ask for something that looks more like Godzilla straight up just coming out of the water right. like the yeah, it was about uh, this is probably the smallest big animal of the group it's probably <laughs> four feet but uh, Godzilla's big and uh, with this lens I, I was shooting the 10 to 17 actually yeah before. yeah so tell uh, us about that so that's the first time we've seen that lens pop up here um, how how close are you getting with that so that's a great lens. Um, this is the go-to lens if you have a crop sensor camera. I highly recommend it. It's a reasonably priced entry point, um, and it's got very, very crisp uh, corners. Uh, for the money, you can't beat this lens. So it, this was a carryover from my D300 that I shot before I moved up to the full-frame DSLR, the D800. And uh, because of that, you can actually shoot the, uh, like the D850, you can switch to a crop mode and still shoot your, uh, your crop um, lenses. But with the 10 to 17, you can usually shoot it in that 15 to 17 range, no problem, even on a full frame. So uh, I wanted a fisheye. So I did the first dive, 16 to 35. Second dive, I wanted a fisheye because um, one thing I learned is uh, the water is worse than Alaska. It's stuff floating around. Mm. And, just, it's very surgy. Um, you know, there's bubbles, there's lots of divers too, because we only get two opportunities. So you really have to get close. And um, so I, I knew I wanted this type of shot. And so I figured this would be a good lens of choice. Um, it also focuses pretty quick. Um, and so with this one, I used a technique, uh, I call, it's just uh, shooting from the hip, basically. So I had actually composed the shot a little different with more blue water um, in in the frame, so he was like half out of it, but he turned and as he went up, I had to move. Now, I can't move my body and my head that quick enough, so I just took the camera out in my hand and you could say shot blindly, um, but I've done it enough that I can position that camera and that lens in respect to the subject to get them in the frame, you know, nine times out of 10. So it's a technique you want to work on uh, because it can really get you some extra shots that you maybe wouldn't get normally. 
Yeah. So don't always think you have to be glued to that that viewfinder. And maybe one of those shots is going to be the keeper, like this one was. Yeah, yeah, I, I really like like the way this one uh, came out. Um, um, Maxine Baker was asking, were you using a magic filter or anything like that here? Um, so this one, I was not using a magic filter. I have used those magic filters uh, for ambient light photography. Um, this one, I actually had strobes on, so you wouldn't want to use that uh, magic filter um, with strobe light. because It's meant for more uh, ambient natural light. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I actually, I, I love that question because I don't know, maybe she thought this was an ambient light shot, which I take that as a compliment because when I try to light my subject, I, I don't want it to look like I'm lighting my subject. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and, and some of that also is in post. I talked about how images can be cool or warm, and so you can adjust that a little bit. But if you blow out something with a strobe, it's really, really hard to recover those uh, those details, um, mm -hmm. if not impossible, if you totally blow it out. Um, so yeah, no magic filter, but they are a good, uh, a good thing to use. I, I do use those uh, with my GoPro, and I've actually got the ones that you cut out and, and insert in the lens as well, uh, okay. that I've used before for recs and things like that. And, and basically to that same point, um, Suzanne Scrim was asking whether this was an ambient light shot or not. And I, it, it is hard to tell. I mean, the way the light is hitting his face coming from the surface there, it's, uh, this would be a good one to try and fake somebody out with strobes or yeah. not. Yeah, no, I, th I appreciate that, Suzanne. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, it's uh, we, this was very shallow uh, water, too. These guys hang out in typically 20 feet or less um, water because the longer they have to go down and stay down, their body temperatures drop, and that really limits how long they can stay down and have to go sun themselves on a nice hot volcanic rock. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, very cool, man. Um Let's see here. Quick question. We're just we're gonna go right back to our whale shot for a second here, um, just because yeah. Maxine Baker was asking uh, whether you were able to work on the blue halo coming in around the whale. Yeah. So good. Uh, good eye there. So anytime you have that bright white subject, um, you're gonna get that flare. So think about a, if you took a white tablet under and the sun hits it, you get that flare. So. That's part of the aperture, I believe, in the, the, you know, trying to make that aperture as small as possible. But if you look closer on the belly of the mother, um, you do see that flare that she's talking about. And it's really hard to eliminate that completely. Um, you can shoot to the histogram all the way to the left, which means make the image darker and then try to bring back. So that'll keep you from maybe overexposing some of that. Um, but with whales, I actually prefer to shoot to the right because there's a lot of detail that you can pull out of them then. I don't overexpose them to the right, but you try to get your histogram to the right. Um, and so it, it's sort of a trade-off. Um, you know, I, I've tried different settings, but in, when that sun's coming down, particularly that hot French Polynesian sun um, hitting that whale, it's hard not to get that uh, that reflection. But you do try to minimize it. And there are some techniques in post. Um, you know, I think the next guest you're going to interview next week might give you some tips on that. But uh, there are some things you can do in post to try to bring that down. But um, this image and most of my images, I didn't do too much to try to get rid of that because to me, it's uh, it's it's a sort of a naturally occurring phenomenon and. It's not too distracting, um, but uh, you could definitely probably try to do that in post. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Thanks for asking. Good answering question. That Thank one. you. Yeah, good question. Um, so let's move on to our final image in the set here. I'm just going to move you over to this corner so you're not covering up old Sharky Boy's nose here. <laughs> let's see. So what what are we looking at? We're looking at um, maybe a, a teenage shark going his through his rebellious phase with some piercings to upset his parents. Yeah, maybe? this is the so. uh, the punk rocker shark there you yep. go uh, yep <laughs> no I, I wish that was the case you would think that uh particularly these blue sharks in rhode island like um jewelry um but uh yeah it's sort of unfortunate um and, and this really is a good example i included in the mix of a way to do more of a conservation shot and tell a story and uh the story is here um you know, since I moved to the East Coast, Rhode Island's really been one of my favorite places to go dive with blue and mako sharks um, with uh, Brian Raymond and, and Joe Romero and the guys up there. Um, and, uh, 
you see a lot of sharks and unfortunately there's a lot of fishing tournaments up there too. So we see a lot of sharks with, with hooks still in them. Um, and I actually asked them one time, well, why is it the blues that always have the hooks? And they said, well, in these tournaments, they don't score as high. So they get them, hook them and just cut the line and throw them back. Oh, man. And it, it's really sad because, you know, after battling them, you can see it's got some damage in it. And this particular shark was still very, very curious coming up. Um, we did have chum uh, in the water. So it's coming in and uh, blue sharks are they've got some of the best personalities. Very curious. I'll say puppy dog like. Uh, you still got to keep your eye on them. You, you don't see those teeth, but believe me, they have teeth. They're just smart because they don't uh, show them until they need them. Mm. Um, so these sharks will come right in close. And this one made several passes, and I noticed it had two two hooks. One was quite rusty and, and had line coming off of it still, and, and it was jaw was pretty messed up. Mm. Um, so I wanted to capture and tell that story, you know, and uh, actually titled this one, you know, Don't Hook Me, Bro. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, tried to create that hashtag. It never took off though. But, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a shame. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so I see you went back to eight to 15 fisheye here. So we're, we're banking on a close pass with these guys. Is that right? We are. Um, so in this case, it, it's a catch, catch 22. You know, these sharks are going to come in close. Uh, so you want as wide as possible. Um, I have shot my 16 to 35, but these sharks are always in your face. Um, but with sharks, you got to be careful because you can over exaggerate some of their features, sort of like the, the, the models or the kids in the water. You don't want their nose to be too long. Um, uh, but sometimes that gives them a cartoon character. It gives them maybe a little bit more personality. Mm -hmm. Um, this one, the eight to 15 is, is sort of my go-to with these blue sharks because I know they're going to come in. Um, this one did come in, you know, it's so close. You can see the uh, ampullae of, uh, Lorenzini, um, mm -hmm. it's little sensory organs on it. Um, but yeah, the eight to 15 is probably the best lens for this setup. And again, it can focus right off the dome port. Uh, so this, this shark, I, I knew it was going to be there and, uh, I just set up and, um, you know, something that will teach sometimes is you get into a situation like that and hopefully you have a whole day of sharks and you really, first thing you do when you're in there, you start taking pictures of sharks and moving around in every which way and, and you're not going to get the most quality shots. So what you have to do is set up for a zone and have a shot in mind. So you say, I'm going to shoot this width and this direction and I'm going to let the sharks come in and even if he's over here. I'm, I'm going to ignore that one. I'm going to wait till that one comes in the zone. So you dial in your settings for the zone. Um, and that's what I did here. I had the strobe set to a certain thing um, where I literally just put my hand out there, made sure my my, my fleshy hand wasn't getting overexposed and, and turning the strobe power down probably to a, a quarter or a third. And this shark was so predictable, I knew that it was going to pass me in this way and its uh, snout was going to be over on this side. So I actually turned down one stop on the um, on the strobe because I didn't want to blow out that nose. But the other strobe lit the uh, the hooks really nicely, and you can even see the shadow from them because that strobe was mm. a, a little bit more powerful. Yeah, I mean, I, two huge things there. I think that what you're talking about setting up for your zone and just being ready for it to come to you instead of trying to chase it. Uh, that that was yeah. the very, very first lesson that our CEO, Jim Decker, gave to me when I was going on my first shark dive was like, pick yeah. your spot and let them come to it. And and I came home with some keepers on my very first dive. I thought, wow, yeah, that's the way to do this. Um, but then again, what you're saying about the strobes, in some of the images we've seen today, it was hard to tell whether you use strobes or not. They were so well lit. But this one, even though it's the lighting is much more pronounced, it's pretty much perfect um, how do you avoid oh. <laughs> blowing out that white belly, especially when it's so close and you're still trying to capture everything else? I mean, it's, I, yeah, I, I guess you kind of well, explain by turning down. If you would have let bit. me put in, if you would have let me put in eight shots, I could have thrown out a bloat in belly, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it is some, some trial and error, but it, it's also just uh, practice and repetition. Um, you know, I photographed these sharks enough, so I know my drop-in settings and I, I don't think I've talked about drop-in settings yet, but, when you're shooting these sharks, you're on a rotation. They don't just dump everyone in the water. So you've got usually one or two people in the water at a time. So when it's your turn to go, you get whatever, 10, 15 minutes. Um, you've got to make the most of it. So 
um, each time you, you review your images, look at your histograms, make adjustments, and you take practice shots on the deck. So I put my fin up and I'm taking pictures of my fin, making sure my focus and the strobes are lighting properly. It's recycling, um, making sure your lens cap isn't removed, which <laughs> Uh, it never happened to me. No, oh, no, um, never. No. Huh. <laughs> but, you know, those that's the most important shot is that shot before you get in the water because this action is fast and you set up for your zone, you've got dialed in and you make make a few little adjustments like I saw this one circling and I looked at it and I'm like, "Ooh, I'm blowing this side out." So I just click all I did is turn it down one stop on the strobe and and it it, it came out with a really nice result. Beautiful. Beautiful. And any work on uh, on this guy in post? Do you have to bring this into Lightroom at all? Yeah, I did. Um, so this one I did. Yeah, so I, I shoot all my images in RAW. They all go through Lightroom. I catalog them, tag them. Um, you know, if they're good, if they're good images, then I'll I'll take a look at them and work on them. Um, this one had several features that I wanted to make sure stood out. One was the hook. That was the story. But I thought that that eye really, really uh, told a good story. And because that one strobe that was a little bit more powerful hit that really nice, I did go in and get a little bit of um, texture uh, to that eye and a little bit of contrast just to make it pop a little bit but not look crunchy or phony. Hopefully it doesn't look that way. No, not um, at all. And even though I turned my strobe down a stop uh, on the setting, it still was a little bit hot on the on the top of that um, snout. So I did take a, a gradient filter and drug it over and just decrease the highlights. And it was a very simple filter to do, and it it, it you know it worked out really nice on this one. So this one was very minimal processing. Okay. Um, so I always strive to um, get it right in the camera. I think all photographers should. Oh yeah. Um, but in today's digital age, your camera can do 80% of it, 75% of it, some may say half of it, but the other part, you need to finish it off and give it that finished look because raw images by nature are not gonna pop, not as much contrast, and you need to work on them. If you wanna shoot JPEG, shoot JPEG and let the camera process it, but then you, you can't do the things in post-processing that we all like to do yeah. without losing a lot of integrity of the image. And our very good friend uh, Jordy was asking, "Oh, excellent! Yeah, what what size dome do you use when shooting something like this? Are you using a four inch dome?" Uh, no, I went I went big because I want to keep my distance from the <laughs> shark. But I mean, I, I see you know, a, a friend of mine, Art, real good guy, Art. If you're listening, hi. Um, he, he was out there with his GoPro and everything, and these sharks are coming in, Mako's blues, and I'm like, oh my gosh, he doesn't have much defense. But no, I, I was using my nine inch uh, glass dome port um, on this, but you could by all means use use a small dome port. Um, these sharks are not aggressive, they're just more curious. So anytime you're doing shark photography, just sort of a safety tip, you wanna keep the, the camera away from you. You don't wanna keep the camera right here because that's allowing the shark to get too close to you. So you need that little safe distance. Uh, the big dome, you know, was nice. I, I will say on this one, um, I, I cropped this one too because uh, before getting in the water, I asked uh, Brian, I said, hey, should I take off my shield, uh, you know, the flare guard on the dome port because I'm shooting the 8 to 15. He's like, well, you could, but, you know, you're probably going to get hit a lot. <laughs> and I'm like, so it was a trade off. Do I risk damaging uh, the dome port? So I left the shield on. So a little bit of behind the scenes, uh, not so pro tip, you know, I had zoomed in or uh, zoomed out a little bit too much. So I started to get a little bit of the top and the bottom of that. Mm. But again, that's an easy crop and post. Um, but I'm so used to as things are coming at me to work that zoom dial with it. Um, so, uh, but it uh, luckily was able to get a few good frames of uh, this particular shark Excellent. tell its story. because Obviously they can't tell their own story. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, Ron, that, that was a really awesome set of images. I mean, I, I don't think we've ever done a photo breakdown like this where we got face to face with so many big charismatic subjects. It was really cool getting your take on these shots too. I really appreciate the, the detail you went to in each one to break them down. There's some excellent tips for every underwater shooter in there. I, I really appreciate that. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. Um, I mean, that's really why I do the workshops. I love sharing that knowledge. When I was coming up and learning, I struggled, but I, I was fortunate enough to have some uh, really talented photographers share their tips with me and, and mentor me coming along. 
Um, and, and I just, I love that aspect of it. And, and what really makes me, uh, you know, excited is when you see someone who you've given some guidance to really nail the shot and maybe even that shot goes on to win some big, big award or be published. It, it's, it's really rewarding. And that means so much to me because they're telling the story of the ocean and, and particularly the sharks. At the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. And I think that is a beautiful message to sign off on. Um, so I think we will yeah, move on with the rest of our day here and bring this broadcast to a close. But man, Ron, thanks again for just sharing your insight and your experience and all these. I think that's uh, yeah, it's just really, really, really fantastic. Uh, we do have another broadcast coming up this upcoming Tuesday. Um, we're going to do that one with the Queen of Lightroom, Erin Quigley. We'll be talking with her about some of her favorite images and how she shot them and maybe a little bit of the dark arts and sorcery that went into them <laughs> after the dive as well. Uh, so please tune in next Tuesday for that. For now, Ron, I'd like to let you sign us off and, uh, and, and wish everybody well. So, hey, Erin. Let's, let's let's say goodbye. <laughs> all right. Thanks for having me today, and uh, everyone stay safe, and I hope to see you all in the water soon and uh, out there doing some photography together. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I'm Robin from Backscatter signing off, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care.